Hello again, welcome in our next session at BIM College. Uh, here we have with us uh, Miren Esnaola. Miren is an IT professional with 20 years of experience in the field. She currently works as cloud consultant in the Google Cloud Professional Services team, helping customers get the most out of Google Cloud data product portfolio. And today, Miren is gonna share with us an overview about Apache Beam, about the Beam model, the Beam components, schemas, and well, everything else. Now I welcome Miren, and please go ahead. Hi, Mara. Um, welcome everybody to this uh, Apache Beam overview session. The, the goal of this session is to introduce you to the key concepts of the Apache Beam model so you get that taste of it and become excited about it and start designing and developing data pipelines using it. So let's get started with uh, telling you what Apache Bean is. So Apache Bean provides uh, an open source unified model for defining both batch and streaming distributed processing pipelines. Um, Apache Bean comes with SDKs that offer an API that developers can use to build the programs that define data pipelines according to the model. Once the pipeline is defined, pipelines can be executed by one of the supported distributed processing backends that uh, Apache Bean supports. Um, Bean was developed out of a number of internal Google technologies. Google uh, donated the model and the core SDK to the Apache Software Foundation in 2016, but uh, remains, uh, remains quite involved uh, because there are like uh, many, many Googlers that continue to contribute to the, to the project uh, regularly. So the beauty of Apache Bean is that we can write a, a program using the available language SDKs and the same code can be used no matter if the data source that we are consuming is a streaming one or not. And also the code that we, that we create is portable. We will be able to run it on a variety of, of supported runners. Uh, provided, of course, that they have implemented the, the capabilities required by, by our code, okay? So currently, Bean has uh, SDKs in Java, Python, and Go. Out of, all, uh, out of those uh, three SDKs, the, the most mature one is the, the Java SDK. Spotify uh, uses Apache Bean heavily to build their data processing pipelines and has also developed uh, a SKIO. SKIO is a, an Scala API. You can execute like pipelines on, on a wide variety of runners. Uh, examples of, of those are Cloud Dataflow, Apache Flink, or Apache Spark. Each runner provides a, a different implementation of the Apache Beam model. If you want to know um, which capabilities of the model are implemented by each of the runners, you simply need to go to, to the Apache Beam website and check the Apache Beam capability matrix. So let's get started with the, with the main concepts of the model. So one of the key concepts of the model are pipelines. Pipelines are, are built by, by developers using the Apache Bean SDKs and define the data processing that those developers want to implement. A pipeline manages a directed uh, a cyclic graph, a DAC of transformations, and the collection of data that they act on. Um, we, we will call the, the transformations uh, PIT transforms and the collections of data that are being consumed and produced, PIT collections. A BIM program typically starts by, by constructing a pipeline object. Uh, when you create your pipeline object, you'll also need to set some configuration options as, as you see on the screen. That is uh, uh, an example of how to, to define your pipeline using Python. 
Pipeline options uh, are used to configure different aspects of your pipeline, such as the runner that is going to execute it and uh, any runner specific uh, parameters. You can set your pipeline's uh, configuration options uh, programmatically, but the, easy, the easiest is generally to, to set the options uh, ahead of time, reading them from the, from the command line and passing them to the, to the pipeline object when it is created. You can also add your own custom options in, in addition to the standard ones. Uh, you can even specify a description. Uh, the description will appear when you invoke uh, the pipeline with uh, minus minus help. And uh, you can also specify a default value for the custom options that you, that you add. So on a screen, you have like a, an example of a pipeline, okay? A typical BIM program uh, works as follows. You create a, a pipeline object and you set the pipeline execution options, uh, including uh, the pipeline runner that you are going to use. Once you have that, you create um, one or more initial collections of data. You can either read data from an external system or, or build, it, build it from in-memory data. Um, the former is typically uh, how a production pipeline would ingest data. We would be reading it from an external system. Uh, BIM's source uh, APIs contain adapters that help us read from external sources, like for instance, like uh, uh, databases or, or uh, services that, that we want to use. And, uh, the 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 other uh, the other possibility was to to build the the collection from data that you have in memory that is mainly used if we are testing or or debugging okay so we have our sources of data the next step is going to be to apply transformations to that uh, to those collections of data that we have transformations can change filter group analyze um, process the elements in the collections. Its, uh, its transformation is going to create the output without modifying the, the input. A typical pipeline applies uh, a, a series of, of transformations on, on each new output until the processing is complete. But that does not really mean that our pipeline needs to be linear. I mean, we can have we can define uh, arbitrarily complex uh, graphs uh, for, our, for our pipeline, okay? And once all the processing is done, we have to write like uh, uh, the, final, the final collection or collections to, to the systems that, uh, that we want to integrate with. A P collection uh, represents uh, a, a distributed data set that uh, your BIM pipeline operates on. A P collection is, uh, in a sense, an, an order, an immutable bag of elements, okay? Collections, uh, P collections have a, a few characteristics that, that define them. We will uh, go through them now. Like, a P collection uh, is owned by the specific pipeline object for which uh, it was created, okay? So multiple pipelines can definitely not share a peak collection. Elements on a peak collection may be of any type, but all of them need to be of the same type. In many cases, the element type in a peak collection has an associated schema. That's uh, the case, for instance, if the elements are defined using like JSON, protocol buffers, Abro, or they are database records. Uh, P collections are immutable. Once we create them, we cannot add, remove, or change the individual elements in them. You can only process its element in the P collection and generate a new P collection as output. P collections do not support random access to individual elements. I cannot go and say, look, give me element number zero, give me element number 20 of the P collection. P 
Peak collections can be bounded or unbounded, okay? So a peak collection um, that is bounded is actually a data, set, a, a data set of a known size. It has uh, boundaries, limits. It has a fixed, uh, fixed size. Um, a, that, is, that kind of peak collections are generally associated to batch, uh, batch use cases. Peak, uh, peak collections can also be unbounded. Unbounded means that our peak collection has an unknown size. We, we don't really know when the, when the collection uh, stops producing, producing elements. Those peak collections are linked to a streaming uh, use cases, okay? And, and then uh, another key thing to know is, is that uh, elements in the in the p in the p collections need uh, some kind uh, of encoding. They have to be encoded as as byte streams because uh, uh, Apache Bean, the Apache Bean model supports uh, distributed processing. Okay, so the SDKs include uh, include built-in encoding mechanisms for for common types that that you normally use. But you can also you can also specify your own um, your own custom encodings. Um, elements in a peak collection have uh, have associated an, an intrinsic timestamp. Uh, an unbounded an unbounded uh, source provides a timestamp for each element. Depending on the unbounded source, uh, it might be that you need to configure how to extract that timestamp. From the raw from the raw data stream, sources that create uh, bounded peak collections automatically assign uh, timestamps. But the most uh, common behavior is to assign to all the elements the the same timestamp. But uh, there is the option to to assign a, a, a timestamp to the to the elements of a peak collection by applying a a, part two, a, a transform. Okay. So we've seen what peak collections are. The next key thing are P transforms, the transformations. They represent operations or steps in our pipeline. Every pre transform takes one or more peak collections as input, executes a, a processing function that the developer uh, provides uh, on the elements, and produces zero or more peak collections uh, as output. Depending on the runner you choose, multiple workers across a cluster may execute code in, in parallel. Uh, to, invoke, uh, to invoke a transform, uh, you just need to apply it to the, to the input P collection. Transforms, this is key, transforms do not alter the input P collection because P collections, as we said before, are immutable. They just process the incoming elements to produce different peak collection as output. How you apply your pipeline transforms determines the structure of the DAG uh, representing your pipeline, okay? The, the graph representing your pipeline. For example, we could have a linear pipeline and apply three successive transforms to an input collection, or we could have a branching pipeline and apply two transforms to the same input P collection to produce two different P collections as output. The BIM SDKs contain generic core transforms and pre-written composite transforms that use those uh, core transforms. You can also uh, use the SDK to build your own composite transforms, uh, nesting multiple transforms in a single one. This is going to help us write the modular code easy to understand and maintain. Applying a transform to a peak collection is very easy. You have, for instance, uh, an example on the screen uh, uh, written in Python on how, how to apply a, a P transform to a collection. You simply use the pipeline, the pipe, sorry, operator and pass the, the transform uh, as an argument, okay? And then once the transform is executed, you get your, your output collection. Let's have a quick look at, at, the, at the core transforms that the, that the Apache Bean uh, model uh, supports, okay? 
Probably the most important transform is uh, what we call the Pardue transform. The Pardue transform takes uh, each element in the input peak collection and perform, perform some, some processing function on that element and emits uh, zero uh, or more elements to an output peak collection. Then we have the combine. The combine uh, combines <laughs> the elements in a P collection according to, to a function. That function needs to be associative and commutative. Um, it can work, that, that transform can work globally or on a per key basis. Like the elements of uh, in a P collection can be key, they can be key value pairs. And these transforms can work on all the elements in a collection, or as I said, per key. And then we have the group by key transform, uh, another very important transform in the BIM model. It takes a key collection of elements and produces a, a collection which each, where each element consists of a key and all the values associated with that key. Next, what we have next, the co-group by key. The co-group by key performs a relational join of two or more key value P collections that have the same key type, okay? And then we can do left joins, right joins, inner joins. So um, next, the partition. The partition is going to split a single P collection into a fixed number of smaller collections. And finally, we have the flatten. The flatten is going to merge multiple P collection objects with elements of the same type into a single P collection, okay? So these are the core transforms. And as I said before, you are going to leverage these transforms and you can potentially build uh, composite transforms to use uh, in your code uh, and reuse them. Uh, so you have like a very modular and clean code. Okay, so those, uh, uh, until now we have introduced like what are the key, the key concepts, the basic concepts of the Apache Beam model. But uh, let's start talking about uh, an early challenge that all of you are going to face when working with, uh, with Beam. That challenge is working with time, okay? So being able to reason about time is essential when you are processing data in a streaming, okay? Um, and that cannot be done without having a clear understanding of the domains of time that are involved, okay? In any system that is processing data in a streaming, we can generally observe a certain amount of lag between the event time that is the time uh, when the data element was created or produced and the processing time that is the time when the data element was observed by the by the processing system the processing time is determined by the system clock so in such systems we cannot have any guarantees that the data elements are observed in the same in the same order they are produced either look at the figure that you have uh, that you have on, on the right of the screen the green dash the green dash line represents uh, it, you see that it has a, a slope of, of one okay it represents the the ideal that's the case where where the processing time and the and the event time are exactly equal okay the orange uh, the orange line represents the the reality uh, in the example we can see that the system lags a bit uh, at the beginning then it veers uh, closer to the ideal in the middle and finally it likes uh, it lags again a bit towards the towards the end okay so uh, two two observations that uh, we can make here um, so there is lack and the lack is variable, okay? It is definitely not consistent. And uh, we will see that, the, that shortly, we will see what the implications uh, of, this, of this are, okay? But uh, let's do something entertaining first, okay? Uh, let's uh, try to understand very easily using this example that I have on the screen, 
the difference between what uh, event time and processing time is. I, I love this uh, this example. It appears in a book uh, by Ellen Friedman and, and Kostas Chomas. Uh, the title is uh, Introduction to, to Apache Flink. Let's consider the Star Wars movies, okay? We have um, episodes uh, four, five, and six where the, the first ones to be released between the end of the 70s and the, and the beginning of the, the 80s. Then came episodes one, two, and three in the late uh, 90s, uh, early 2000s. And finally, the episodes uh, seven, uh, eight, and nine um, were released on the on the second half of the of the last decade. Okay, so think of the episodes, uh, the episode number as the event timestamp, and the the date when you watch the the movie as the processing uh, as the processing time. Okay, if you watch the movies in the order they came out, uh, as I did. The, the order in which you process the movies is not consistent with the order of their narrative, okay? As I am not such a nerd, I can now tell you that, that the Star Wars would have made much more sense to me if someone would have ordered uh, those episodes. And that's something that we can actually do uh, using, the, uh, using Apache Bing, okay? So going back to the to the graph that uh, we had uh, before on the screen, the one on the right. Uh, let's take any point uh, on, uh, in time on the on the orange line. Okay. So the vertical distance to to the green line that represents uh, reality is what we call the processing time lag, and it tells us how much delay is observed between the time when the event uh, occurred and the time when the event was processed. The horizontal uh, distance to the green line is what we call the event, uh, the event time skew. And it tells us how far behind the ideal we are processing events. At any point in time, um, so um, um, at any point in time, um, both distances are equal. They are just two ways of looking at the same at the same thing to cope uh, with the fact that uh, when we are uh, um, processing uh, and streaming and a streaming source uh, we don't have uh, the certainty of uh, when the source is going to stop producing uh, new events um, most streaming systems typically provide some kind of notion of what we call windowing what is windowing? In a sense, it means that we are going to chop up the, the, our data set, our incoming uh, data set, in, uh, in some finite pieces um, along temporal uh, boundaries, OK? So if you care, if you care about the, correct, the correctness of the results that you are giving out of your pipeline, um, and uh, then what it makes sense is to analyze the data in the context uh, of event time, OK? Um, and then what we said, what we said before, um, that the, the lack that we are going to experience is, is variable. So how, how can you determine when you've observed all the data for a given uh, event time frame? We will shortly see that the Apache, the Apache BIM model deals with all these challenges, OK? It has an answer for, for, for all these challenges. So uh, we said before that, uh, that when processing like unbounded uh, data, uh, data sources, the use of Windows uh, is actually instrumental, OK? In Apache BIM, uh, a window, what it does, it subdivides a peak collection according to the timestamps of its individual elements. We will see uh, that windows can, can be defined based on the processing time or on the, on the event time, OK? When are we going to use uh, processing time windows? We are going to use when we need to infer information about a data source as it is uh, observed. A typical use case is, is monitoring. For instance, uh, we want to understand, like we have a web service, and we want to understand uh, like the rest, uh, the rate of request that we have received in the last uh, in the last five minutes. That's a good case for for processing 
time uh, windows, okay? And then um, what can we say about processing time? Uh, processing time windowing, it is simple, okay? Uh, the implementation is extremely straightforward. You never have to worry about shuffling data within time. You just buffer data uh, as it arrives, and then you send it downstream uh, when, the, when the window closes, okay? So judging when a window is complete is very straightforward too. Like the system has perfect knowledge of whether all inputs for a window have been seen. There is uh, no need also to be able to deal with uh, late data in any way, okay? And then uh, we have the event time windowing. The event time windowing is used to infer information about uh, a data source uh, as, as it occurs, not, not as it observes, uh, as it is observed, as we were saying before. So uh, typical use cases uh, for this are user behavior trend analysis, billing, so for instance, what is the balance uh, in my mobile prepaid account uh, at this particular moment in time, or uh, scoring, uh, which are the top five five players that uh, are, are playing uh, this uh, a particular game in a, in a gaming platform. Um, event time window uh, is, uh, provides us with much more accurate uh, results when, when processing, but it really raises uh, additional challenges, okay? Often windows must uh, live uh, longer uh, in processing time than, than their actual length, okay? So uh, more buffering of data occurs, okay? And it is also generally uh, hard to, use, to judge when the, when the window uh, is complete, okay? We can just um, only implement procedures to, to estimate when the window can be considered uh, closed. So to, to deal with that, like uh, being tracks uh, a watermark. The watermark uh, provides some kind of notion of when the data in a certain window can be expected to have uh, to have arrived. Okay, once the what that uh, the watermark progresses uh, past the end of the window, any further element arriving with a timestamp in that window is considered late data. Okay, so let's consider the the example that we have on a screen. We want to get the the sum of the elements that we that we are receiving in event time windows uh, of two minutes. Okay. A watermark uh, uh, T declares that the, the event time has reached time T in that window. And it means that uh, there should be no more elements uh, from the stream with a timestamp that is uh, older or equal to the, to the one of the watermark. So in the example that we have on, a, on the screen, we, we received first the, the five, and then uh, we received an, an element uh, seven, like past, uh, past the end of the window. The, the watermark moved to that point. So we can consider, consider that uh, window closed and, and uh, uh, aggregate the, the results, okay? So that's the whole point of the, of the watermark. And then we have uh, another concept, that is the concept of, of triggers. What triggers do is they, they allow us to, the, to modify and refine the windowing strategy that we are using for, for the P collection, okay? So you can use triggers to, to decide uh, when each uh, individual window aggregates and reports uh, results, including like how, how the window is going to emit late elements, okay? So for instance, we could have, uh, if we go back to the, let's go back to the previous example, okay? So imagine that um, um, we wanted to, to see uh, results before, before the watermark uh, went uh, past the end of, of the window because we wanted to have preliminary results, okay, in our data pipeline. We wanted to have the sum earlier on. So we could have a trigger uh, with, a, with an early firing that we will give us a, a result and some indication on how the calculations are going. Similarly, 
we have uh, we could use uh, triggers to manage uh, the um, the arriving of of late data okay and emit data once the watermark went past the end of the window but also when recalculate or or, or present results again uh, every time that we are receiving uh, late data so that's the kind of thing that that triggers uh, are going to allow us to do okay so let's do a, a recap of all these uh, um, of, of all these concepts that are related to 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 time in in the model okay so we have on one side the windows the windows are going to tell us how how our data is going to be is going to be grouped okay uh, then we have the the watermark the watermark is going to tell me when I have received all my data uh, like uh, in the window, okay? When my window is what we say complete. And then we have the, the trigger, okay? So the trigger is going to tell, uh, to tell us when we are going to produce the results. Are we going to produce the results a bit earlier so we, so we get some preliminary insights? Are we going to reprocess like after we do receive some kind of, of late data. So, and that's, uh, that's basically it. Just, uh, I want to add uh, what the default behavior of Apache Bean is in terms of uh, windowing and triggers and late data, okay? So Apache Bean, what it does, it assigns by default all elements of a peak collection even those peak collections that uh, are uh, streaming ones that are uh, unbounded to a single global window. Um, we will see uh, during the, this, uh, this uh, training sessions um, that uh, there are certain, certain transforms, like for instance, the group by key that require a, a, a window that is not the global window, okay? They require, require some time uh, boundaries, okay? And then um, the other thing that you have to need that uh, to need about the defaults of Apache Bean is that it uh, by default emit, emits results when the watermark uh, passes the end of, of the window, okay? And to, to, to customize that, we, we, can, we can use the triggers. And finally, uh, by default, uh, Apache Bean discards uh, any, any data that is uh, arriving arriving late okay so this is all that uh, that we wanted to cover in, in this introductory introductory session okay i hope that it's been useful for you i hope that the the ones that are new to the apache beam model got uh, a good uh, introduction and that those that uh, already knew uh, uh, about the model they had the the opportunity to refresh their knowledge uh, of the main um, key concepts, okay? So thanks uh, everybody. And now uh, I'm ready, I mean, we are ready to take uh, your questions, your questions uh, on the model, okay?